Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me here at uh, the Smart Contract Summit. Uh, yes, uh, regarding that provocative title, uh, I think this is something I'd love to dig into a little bit more because uh, starting off with, um, you see a lot within crypto and all of these networks, this is really a rallying cry uh, for, for a lot of teams, a lot of protocols of just decentralized everything. It will be better. It will be the future. Um, but the reality is it's not always us to decide. There's a lot of market forces. So it's really what does the market uh, and, and the global market uh, going to respond to decentralization? Can decentralization be or enable products to be faster, better, cheaper? What is the value that ultimately then can interact with those market forces? And so these are some of the, the limitations that we're generally up against. Um, and so this is a very broad list, right? And these are the things that kind of get mentioned a lot, right? Uh, because in the decentralized networks, you get a lot of other positives, um, which I'll talk about. And everything all can't be positive. So there's going to be some trade-offs. And these are some of the, the very common ones, even when it's around interacting with these protocols, whether it's uh, developer tools or the interfaces or a consumer user experience. Uh, the integration complexity is also something not to be overlooked when we're trying to build these new technologies. We don't want to be pushing them into the market. We really want more of this pull experience into the market of technologies that are so useful to the market, they're getting pulled into the usage because they're so much better than what's already there. So one quick example around even the market value of what decentralization can bring, a really easy example, people might remember BitTorrent when it first launched, it was literally more than 50% of the entire internet global traffic. That's how used this protocol at this time was. And people often used it for probably illicit purposes or piracy or getting access to all different sorts of media files, right? Some of us might have been a part of this, but now you have something like Netflix, which is a totally centralized service. So BitTorrent being a very decentralized peer-to-peer -peer service from the ground up, and it could be used for lots of file transfers as we're aware. Netflix is a completely centralized service, but you could argue now that Netflix provides better content, more secure content, much safer without viruses or risk of downloading malicious files. It's considerably faster and it has all the content you're looking for. And so Netflix is literally, I believe it's the number one bandwidth using website or service in the entire world. And it makes at times up to 20% of all global internet traffic. So how come we went from this decentralized protocol to now a completely centralized product that I think a lot of people can argue is better in just about every single way. In this example, the decentralized component, the market value was purely access to content. It wasn't that BitTorrent was better, faster, cheaper. It was that it had access to all the content that the market and people wanted. And now that some of the centralized services have picked up to that and now offer that similar content, well, now the playing field has shifted tremendously. And I think we've seen the evolution of both of these companies or projects and where they've ended up. And so it's really about identifying what is the value that decentralization can potentially bring. So... I'm very selfishly uh, motivated on the payment side, uh, as was mentioned earlier. So without getting into too much detail, uh, the retail payments ecosystem is sort of a mess. There's a lot of components in it, a lot of individual, there's up to 12 individual parties that are processing payments uh, through proprietary gateways, exposing information. The, the incumbents that have built this network over the past 50, 60 years are incredibly resilient. Uh, all sorts of unsurmountable switching costs and you have the merchants on one side uh, that are having to continue to pay for this very expensive service. Um, lots of fraud, no reasonable alternatives. It's really complex. So if you want to look at this and say, oh, well, payments can now be great too. Uh, you know, this is almost prime for change. But is decentralization potentially the answer, right? Would decentralization fix some of that stuff uh, with all those entities and that complexity? It might even make it worse. So when you look at it, though, and you dig in a little bit deeper into what really costs the most money uh, or where the cost is in processing global payments, it turns out it's the payment validation itself. So 
it, you need to be able to verify the authenticity of the funds. So are these funds actually valid? What are these funds? And then when a funds transaction is actually taking place, verifying that that transaction is valid even after the fact. So it turns out that that process is highly centralized now and that card networks, for instance, in a payment card transaction would be solely responsible for making decisions or collecting data or basically governing that process of, is this transaction real? Is this transaction valid? Are the funds valid? And it also turns out that validating funds of this sort is literally the best thing that decentralized systems can do potentially in the authenticity of a transaction or funds. So it turns out that the root of the main cost of all payment transactions is validating the payment itself, which turns out then a decentralized network can solve that the very best. So there's definitely something here. And so that's what we created with Flexa. Flexa is now just a, a new payments network, all digital network that connects to all existing hardware, software that merchants already have to enable all different sorts of digital assets to be spendable online, in store, uh, instantly, and with no fees. And so uh, looking at this now, as I sort of mentioned a little earlier, so Flexa is a centralized entity. It's a legal entity that then connects with all of these merchants, all the backend software, all of the hardware they already have, the partnerships that they need, the legal agreements, the licensing to be able to operate and transmit funds and be a money transmitter business, and all of the backend stuff, the integrations to allow a QR code to be scannable at a point of sale anywhere in the world, all of that is a highly centralized process that can be streamlined by removing a lot of the other entities, but nonetheless, a very sort of old school backend technology play. But then you now harness what I just mentioned around opening, having open uh, sort of validation networks of now funds verification. You can open the other side of the network entirely free uh, through an SDK and other products to allow anyone to interact with it. So now the way that Flexa works, it's a centralized entity, but it decentralizes access through basically any app in the world that can now pay using these assets with their own users into the Flexa network. And that's a permissionless system. And so the whole uh, sort of goal uh, that is in work here is fraud through payments from any app in the world. We've got digital wallet apps uh, online literally right now at uh, some of the largest merchants in the world that you can spend in store and online. Uh, many more of those digital cryptocurrency wallets um, will be live very soon. But the whole plan from the very beginning is also as we start evolving into loyalty apps, uh, loyalty points, coupons, all different sorts of digital assets that a user would have in the apps that they already have them in. It's no moving anything around. It's literally just opening the app and paying from there. And it even is getting into uh, traditional finance apps. So when you start looking at consumer incentives, these are the apps that people already have, they already love, they already use them. And now you're just unlocking the universal potential of the apps they already have to now just spend them anywhere and whatever assets that they have. And so one other really important kind of critical part is that to enable all this behind the scenes, we also use a collateral system. And this is all, again, open source, permissionless. Anyone can participate in this. And now for the first time with the new decentralized or distributed technologies, uh, we use a collateral system that allows us to decentralize the risk in payment transactions. And that's literally what I was mentioning earlier, where all the cost comes into play. There's a, almost zero marginal cost for a network participant to verify a transaction uh, on a public blockchain, for instance. So if you or I were to go read uh, Etherscan and say, uh, did a transaction occur on Ethereum? We can do that for, all, for a trivial cost to any network participant. And that's what we really wanted to harness in terms of providing collateral and then verifying that transactions have ultimately been made. And it really gets at the core concept of economic finality. A lot of people want to talk about, oh, there's instant finality here or the shortest finality here. You can use these proof of stake systems or you can use this centralized system or whatever it all looks like. There's always some level of fairly significant economic finality. When you start looking at edge cases or deliberate attacks, which is bound to occur when you're looking at a retail, a global retail payment system. There's going to be lots of attacks coming into your system, trying to exploit it, lots of edge cases. 
you really need enough economic finality. How long does it take for a transaction to be considered reasonably final? And as a part of that, all the people that provide collateral into the Flexa network, uh, all the fees that are collected from merchants are used to market purchase more of the network token, and then it's distributed back to the people providing the collateral. So all that means is that if you provide the collateral in the first place, you're literally earning all of the rewards and all of the incentives uh, in the system. And the native token is called AMP, and it's also a fixed supply token. So as the network starts to grow, more and more wallets are using this, more and more collateral is in place, more and more of these tokens are basically repurchased from the market. It creates this really, really nice virtuous cycle in this loop of the users gaining all of the economic benefit that again, is not possible without a decentralized system. If you don't use this technology that I've been mentioning, you can't enable something like this because if you have to trust a centralized entity to distribute these tokens, to verify the tokens, or to even monitor this in the first place, the whole thing falls apart. <clears throat> so what it really comes down to then is this hybrid approach. Uh, so there's highly centralized infrastructure, which we really deem is, is necessary. It's allowing us to connect with all of the merchants, all of the hardware, all of the software, all these partnerships, all the exchanges, all of the OTC, exchanging and providing liquidity for all different sorts of assets, anything you can start to imagine. All of that is a complicated mess that does require the centralized entities to really perform. And it can be more agile that way, actually. Also, when you look at funds remittance, being able to pay out merchants, what sort of currencies they're looking for, what is the timing, fitting within their operational needs, all of that is the way it works right now. You don't want to change any of that. It works for them. So it's not so much that the process doesn't work, it's that it costs a lot of money and it's very slow. And so then you also start getting into licensing, uh, all the global the jurisdictions you'll be working with. So the centralized piece of the entity covers all of this and absorbs all of the work, the backend work around making all of this happen. But then the really powerful piece is the decentralized infrastructure that sits outside of that and outside of the control of the centralized part. And so the network is open. Anyone can participate. Any wallet can join the network and start using their assets to pay into the system. The token itself, the AMP token, is literally this new form of a, a business model that allows the users to accrue all the value in the system. Uh, the pricing oracle, also why we're so excited to have been working with Chainlink, that's like the, the heart, the beating heart of how this works, because you can't have Flexa saying, oh, here's what the price of this asset is, or here's what the value of the collateral is. If the collateral is the heart of the system, you need a decentralized oracle to be able to say, here's what this is worth based on the ecosystem, not based on a centralized entity. So that is so critical. And we do use Chainlink now for all of the pricing uh, within Flexa, which has been absolutely fantastic. Really proud of how that's all come together. Um, also, then you start looking at uh, the rewards distribution, liquidity, uh, off-chain voting. All those things are pretty standard, but nonetheless bring a ton of value to the AMP ecosystem it itself, which then basically can sit on top of or interact with the Flexa network. And so the real quick summary, uh, Flexa is this you know, standard uh, I guess, old school technology. Uh, it's a proxy for the existing system. It, it, at the end of the day, it does have a very, very simple business model of facilitating payments for a fee. But then it gets so interesting because beyond that, what you attach it to is this really interesting competitive component where decentralizing risk is literally the key. And that's where you can start saving. I mean, that's literally potentially where 95% of the cost of all payments sit. And so by doing that, you're, you're driving that cost down to zero, which allows a network like this to be ultra competitive. Uh, in addition to this, the, that network, the users becoming um, the beneficiaries of all the value in the network. There's actually additional, um, so the incentives within that can be very powerful, uh, additional security of how that all works. And kind of the summary point is, uh, we, we truly believe that this isn't us deciding, it's the market driving us towards the best, most impactful result. Uh, by doing something like this, you literally get the best of both worlds. And so that's what we've been excited to see, continue to moving on. Uh, and yeah, excited uh, for what we've had so far with Flexa. <clears throat>
and then here's where you can find a little bit more information. Uh, but you can find us. Uh, we're online, uh, Discord, Telegram. You can find us. Very straightforward. Uh, happy to chat uh, anything further or get anyone connected. Um, anyone wants to use Flexa wallets uh, or building on top using AMP token as collateral, uh, sky is the limit. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you so much, Tyler. I appreciate your presentation. Uh, a little sneak peek into the payments industry and all the linkages that go between things. Maybe you and I will get together and talk fintech sometime in payments. Um, like when you when you swipe your card at a restaurant and you wait, you know, it, it comes back with an amount, but you leave a tip. Like that's a crazy amount of compliance and due diligence that's going back with, between 10 parties, you know, at once just for that sort of simple transaction. Uh, mm -hmm. Wonderful to have you and your insight there.